We are all a little depraved and debaucherous. Here is the king of podcasts. It's going to be a very spicy episode of the program tonight as we go ahead and talk about the ending of Riverdale. Now, I will say this. Riverdale, I only watched four seasons. When I saw that season five was going to go with a seven-year time jump, I was like, oh, so we're not going to get them in college? We're going to just jump forward? Nah. 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 Not for me. You know, all professional, whether we're going to be, yeah, that's not much that I wanted. So the Archie Comics universe, Riverdale moved up in season five, and then it would move seven years ahead. And I'm like, I'm not interested. And I say this because when any show has to do that personally is jumping the shark. The best example I can give you is desperate housewives. If you ever watched that show, I was pretty adamant in watching desperate housewives. This was a guilty pleasure. I'm not going to lie. All right. They decided, well, we're going to take them like 10 years ahead. No, no. And you know what? This show went downhill from there. And you know why they do it? It's because these shows like this, especially when they have to do, you know, 22 episode seasons and this show ended with 237, I think it was right. Look, I get it. It's going to be difficult for them to go ahead and keep putting out stories that are going to be interesting enough to watch that show, but it's, it's not going to plus it's network TV. You're running out of ideas. So you just can't keep going on the normal lexicon. That is the progression. Listen, it's just not easy anymore. Okay, it's not easy anymore for all these different series, especially on streaming or anywhere else to keep that going. When a series decides to go forward and maybe they change everything in a season. Okay, sure. That's fine. But when you're doing this right here, you can't. They might as well have just stopped Riverdale at season four and just restarted the series as something else. You could have just spun it off, create a sequel, but they didn't want to do that for whatever reason. So yeah, not teenagers anymore. Done. Then they were not even teenagers anyway, but for me, no, I do not want to go ahead and see all these, you know, not going to the college or not going to high school, like the whole transition. I didn't want that. No. So they're all going to be 25 years old. Pass. Pass. That means we're going to get all these other people involved, right? And they're all going to have their own individual relationships that go bad and this and that. I'm sure all that happened. But I lost interest right then and there. Because they, they, you know, they had to go and figure something and to go and keep the show going. So they decided to put out something at the ending, which has got everybody's attention. But let's go ahead and talk about what they talk about. I'm going to take it for movie web real quick. Now, the show always was very wild as it was which is fine. I, I'm, I'm all good about that. The show had alien abductions, serial killers, supernatural entities going back at the time in the 1950s. And basically they shall talk about the fact about how you would think Riverdale has taken enough lies because they would always kill people in that show. Well, the finale is not as chaotic as some expected. It's not totally anticlimactic either. You at the end, you see an 86 year old Betty Cooper reading Jughead Jones's obituary King in the, she's the last remaining student from her class or year who is still alive. And then her ghost, his ghost appears to her and offers her a chance to relive the last day at Riverdale high. Why? He says she was sick with the bumps. We learned about the lives of the characters and how some of them passed on. Pop Tate ended up dying in a sleep after her senior year. Polly gave birth to her twin children and had a, Happy life with her family. Reggie played professional basketball for Kansas State before playing for the Lakers. And after he became a head coach for Riverdale High and had two sons, one of them runs the Mantle Motors. And then there's all these other characters that were part of this as well. Cheryl and Tony moved west and stayed in Oakland Hills, becoming artists. Cheryl had an incredibly successful painting career. Tony promoted activism and her beautiful artwork. They had a son named him Dale after Riverdale, right? Because they're the couple, you know, the lesbian couple, right? And the couple passed away peacefully. In an extended version of the finale, Julian enlisted in the military and died at 28 in Vietnam. Tom Keller and Frank Andrews murdered by a hustler they picked up at some point. And then they talk about who ended up with whom. 
So with all the love interests that we had across the board with all these, you know, whether it was Archie, Veronica, Betty, and Jughead all kind of fooling around with each other, do they all end up together as a quad? Do they go their separate ways? Well, they reveal that their senior year, they were indeed in a romantic quad relationship. They were polyamorous. Archie told Betty it was best to always be the two of them, that whole boy and girl next door romance trope, but Betty knew that they never meant, were meant to be. Right. And maybe that was for the best. Our Jughead, Veronica, Betty, and Archie went their separate ways sometime after graduating high school. Jughead went to New York City, started his own magazine, did not marry or have children, and passed away. Archie went to build some highways, but intended to return to Riverdale, went to California, became a professional construction worker, as well as an amateur writer, settles down with somebody and had a family before he died. Body was buried next to his father's back in Riverdale. Veronica goes back to Los Angeles, becomes a movie producer, wins two Oscars for her movies. She died. Body was buried in the Hollywood Forever, Hollywood Forever Cemetery, but it was the only person not yet and lived the longest, right? But yeah. Everybody's caught up in the fact that there was a foursome and there's backlash about it. Riverdale was getting slammed because of this as a result. So the show's writers decided to go and go this route in a polyamorous relay. And when the finale was talked about, Betty Cooper's character, Lily Reinhart makes a point that quote, it started innocently enough with the four of us going on dates. And then it kind of naturally evolved from there and made the point some nights Archie was sneaking in my bedroom and Veronica would go home with Jughead. Other nights Archie would spend the night at the Pembroke and I'd go over to Jughead's. And sometimes more often than you would imagine, I would find my way to Veronica's. Yeah, they're all fucking each other. <laughs> Anyways, the revelation generated mixed feelings amongst viewers. Those, there were those who thought that out of all the outlander storylines Riverdale came up with, that was the stupidest. Now, this is the actual clip of... Betty, Archie, Jughead, and Veronica all being in a quad relationship. And this is the clip. Our soulmates. Sorry, I know I'm being silly. Well, um, speaking about soulmates, what about you guys? Have the four of you figured out what you're going to do yet? The four of us? What do you mean? Betty, it's us, Clay and I. We know the truth. But if you want, we're happy to keep up the ruse that you're only dating Archie and not the others. The others. It, 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 come on, don't tell me you've suddenly forgotten that you, Archie, Veronica, and Jughead have been in a quad this entire last year. A quad? <gasps> That's what they did. So Clay and Kevin, I forgot that was the gay couple. And, you know, they all did this thing where they checked the boxes on like the, all these different relationships that had to be part of high school. I, fine. I got it. But the thing is, so they all fuck each other. <laughs> That's what they came up with. I think it's funny. But, you know, Clay always knew this about everybody. And like, I remember he was trying to like find himself then found out he was gay and then he had discovered himself and he, you know, finally got it all figured out, which was fine. Good. But it was just all funny about all this, like, coming to pass, and then, okay, we get this story. <laughs> a Riverdale foursome. Did anybody else think this was going to happen, or, like, you know, any kind of thought about it? But, yeah. So the polyamory community is not happy about it. And so there was a lot talked about it. And there's a lot of people that made a pretty big thing about it. So... Brett Chamberlain is the executive director of Open, the Organization for Polyamory and Ethical Non-Monogamy. So you got the poly polygamists, the po polyamorous, excuse me, polygamists, polyamorous, pissed off at you because you didn't represent polyamory right. What the fuck? Wow. Brett told TMZ that although Riverdale attempted to celebrate non-monogamous non relationships on TV, it should have been executed more responsibly. You can't, this is what Riverdale needs to understand. You can't make anybody happy because you created all these relationships. Look, even the polyamorous community didn't like what you did. Now, maybe this Brett Chamberlain is speaking on behalf and really isn't speaking for all the polyamorous couples out there in open relationships. Maybe not, but this is the thought they thought was good. 
Quote, it's frustrating that Riverdale uses characters' non-monogamous relationship as a shocking twist rather than engaging with authentic portrayal of non-monogamy as simply being part of people's identities. Well, maybe there's a part where they all fuck each other, they're all safe with each other. Does that make sense? If they're polyamorous, they don't want to go ahead and, you know, contract any sexual diseases. They're just going to catch it all themselves. They all got hep C. They all got hep C. Does that make sense? I don't know anymore. It doesn't make sense to me. Listen, I can't believe the, the, the thing is, it wasn't even the shock about the twist. It wasn't even that, honestly, because I can almost understand they were all fucking each other. That, that actually probably sounds right. It's the outrage of the polyamorous community. Like, what? What is that? But that's what they got into. They got upset. He goes on to say, we didn't see or hear anything about why these characters practice non-monogamy, what it means for them, the substance of the relationship agreements or communication practices, or any of the other underlying motivations of work that make relationships of any type function. Okay, relationship agreements, what it means to them. How do you fit that into a Riverdale storyline? I'd love to know what that is. This guy is just using this platform just to get word out there about open. I think everybody should be able to go and see that clearly is what's happening here. Brett Chamberlain just wants attention. Okay. Just like I'm probably getting, trying to get a little bit of attention using my program to talk about this because I think it's, I think it's quite amusing. Not about the fact that, listen, they always broke the barrier when it comes to like who would fuck with anybody. Okay. That was fine. Did they have older, younger? I think they did. Didn't they? Like they bet everybody was fucking some way around. That's the way the Riverdale show was. And then they had all this other stuff going on. It was a complete, you know, cluster, which was fine. That was organized chaos. Like that was what the show was. Like I said, the only thing that got me a little bit turned off was the fact that we're going to go seven years ahead. I'm like, ah, you're doing that. You're jumping the shark. Kind of turned me off on that. And I never checked the ratings to see if that actually hurt them in the process by doing that. But I have to check that. Here we go. The Riverdale ratings when they did. Okay. The ratings went down. And by the way, it went down significantly after season four. Hmm. So if I look at what we have right now, the risk is the ratings among uh, the ratings graph. This is from IMDb. I want to say this. That the ratings would just keep going down consistently. But let me look at the Nielsen ratings. That's what I want to look at. The actual Nielsen ratings. Can we see that here? Somewhere. Oh, here we go. It started off with 1.69 million viewers for the first season. They did 13 episodes. Then season two, over 2 million. It was hot. 1.7 million viewers for season three. And then the reason why they went to season four and then what they did, you know, it ended with 1.35. So there's a big drop going on. And there are no ratings figures I could find for what happened to the show after season six and seven, but they probably didn't do well. That's why. But now anyways, that's the other part that's being said about the whole story with the whole thing here. So now Sarah Schechter, the River, the executive producer of Riverdale said that they had a good reason for ending the series with the quad. And she broke it down in a post finale interview with variety magazine. I'm going to take that real quick and bring that up. The finale was titled Goodbye, Riverdale. And Sarah Schechter made the point that the love triangle slash square, uh, I've, uh, slash square, have been a focus since the beginning of the series. And the four characters were in. Now, this is the question that Variety asked. And she says that I think anyone who tells you there was always a plan, they're lying. We always had so many conversations not wanting this to be retro in the wrong ways, not meant to be reductive in the wrong way. So what they did was modern and fitting. They wanted to make a really conscious effort to step away from everything in the pilot of the Archie comics. There's a maturity to what they did. A person's life isn't who they end up with. It's deeper and more meaningful than that. Roberto is such a theater fan. And you can really feel our town in it with a quad. It's still Riverdale. I thought it was a kind of amazing choice that kind of all ended up in the afterlife together that allows people to root forever. 
And she makes a point that I think there was a fantastic, fantastic amount of LGBTQ plus representation on the show. There's a whole lot more to the story, but I think that says everything. I would love to know what everybody thinks about this. But the thought of us going to this point and saying, oh, okay, well, you know, this happened. And the show goes out like this. Oh, the showrunner and writer, Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, is Roberto, by the way, if you wanted to know that. Very responsible for what was going on with the interviews anyway. And he didn't talk to him because of the writer's strike, by the way. So now, that's going on with that. <laughs> so goodbye, Riverdale. That's done. I did enjoy the show, by the way. Like I said, for four seasons, I thought it was fun. But like I said, when it jumped the shark, it jumped the shark. And if you had to ask me who I found the most attractive and most appealing of characters of the women on the show, okay, by the way, if you had to tell me, it would be Veronica, Betty, Tony, and Cheryl. Just saying it in that order, just to say. Now, let's move along to something else when it comes to, in a very similar tinge, there's a study that came out. Women are more likely to engage in malevolent infidelity compared to men. Mm. And then we're going to get into Logan Paul, Nina Agdal, sec, and then that coming up next. So let's talk about this real quick. A new study that was published in the Journal of Sexual and Relationship Therapy examined physical, emotional, and malevolent f- infidelity as they related to gender and the dark tetrad of personality. So they explored various variables. 240 Australian individuals aged 18 to 67 were in the research. And they wanted to clarify that it was necessary to consider different types of infidelity. Some past researchers distinguished physical or sexual infidelity from emotional infidelity. But they also wanted to check malevolent infidelity, which defined as infidelity motivated by revenge and the intent to cause a partner harm. What they found was participants scoring high in psychopathy were more likely to have committed physical and emotional fidelity. Both high psychopathy and sadism were predictive of malevolent infidelity. As well, high narcissism uniquely explains some of the variation of emotional infidelity. Machiavellianism offered no predictive power in physical or emotional activity in, in infidelity excuse me, beyond the dark tetrad trait. So what they said is, is that women are more likely to cheat as a matter of revenge compared to men. So women feel like in this study that they learned from these subjects that women will cheat for revenge purposes to go against their ex or someone else just for the sake of it. Yeah. Revenge fucking (laughs) revenge cheating. They're willing to do that. And they're not having any problem with that. So there's that story. Now moving along, let's go into Logan Paul and Nina Agdal, which, by the way, these, the fur has been flying on this shit for a while. Let me tell you what, this has been quite a bit. Now, Dylan Dennis is an MMA fighter that's going to be fighting a boxing match with Logan Paul October 14th. And leading up to the fight, Dylan Dennis is basically getting underneath Logan Paul's skin. So there we go going on with that. Take it from MMA fighting. I'll take it from this first. So there were pictures of Logan Paul's fiance, Nina Agdal, which, by the way, he met in last year. And then what was it in July? Decided to propose, right? Pretty quick turnaround from dating to marriage. So Dennis is doing some real mental warfare before the foul, before the bout, excuse me. And Logan Paul talked to Misfits Boxing. He says that, listen, I think he's gone too far. And it's not affecting me, no, because when I entered his fight, I knew Dylan was a scumbag. I know he'd take it as far as he did, but, you know, actions have consequences. But, you know, I think he's going to get what is coming to him. Me and my girl don't have to defend ourselves or try to prove our love for the world. Like my fiance is a fucking angel. He's twisted a narrative of her relationship with long-term boyfriends getting paparazzi over the course of her adult life. And he's good. He's a good Twitter troll. But again, he's going to pay for it. All right. And so there's more to go along with this that's being said. But let's go into the actual story now. Because a lot of stuff has been talked about it. So 
Dylan Dennis actually shared an X-rated video of Nina Agdahl discussing her sexual cravings online. Oh, boy. And here's part of what was being said about the fight leading up to it. So let's go ahead and get to this part real quick as they had the press conference to to, to announce the fight. Here's some of that. Throw the cake and see what happens to you. Hey, Try to throw the cake and see what happens Dylan to you. Dylan knocked out in his full glory on the floor, just like he'll be October 14th. It's not a good comeback, by the way. I mean, I get why he's trying to go and go after Dylan Dennis the way he is, but like this is like Logan Paul acting a Logan Paul character. It doesn't necessarily act like he's overly angry about what happens here, but you know, let me see if I can find the clip because you know what I want to go and find out is to see if we can find out what the hell she said that got everybody all caught up. Cause that's the one thing we want to go and see that they actually was discussed. So I found the video. Here's what it is. By the way, I'm very proud of myself. This is the longest I've ever gone without sex since I started. Obviously, it's really crazy. I am struggling. I mean, penis inside of me. ASAP. Like, all I want is like a big fat sausage just destroying my body. So the whole thing is, there's a lot of performative kind of shit that's going on here to make this up. But the whole idea is that, you know, guys are, or especially like the alpha male community is very outraged that Logan Paul is allowing this all to happen as it is. So that's the part everybody's kind of upset about. And, you know, there's a lot more to it. So, like I said, we got that here. And he posted a video of on X of Paul's fiance. Nina Agdahl is talking explicitly about the need Never for sex. show which place. Right? Agdahl is 31 years old. She had a one-year relationship with Oscar-winning actor Leonardo DiCaprio. And, but the thing is that part of it is with her is that I forget how old she was when she dated Leo DiCaprio, but obviously Leo DiCaprio has his cap at 25 years old. Because when a girl gets a 25, kicked out of curb. It's just what he does. Pretty obvious, pretty predictable. Now, she's a Danish model, close to 2 million followers on Instagram. Logan Paul and Nina Agdahl have been around together for 15 months after first meeting at an event in New York City, and they celebrated their one-year anniversary back in May. And then this summer, he dropped on a one knee, proposed her while on holiday in Italy together. Yes, that's what it was. So right here we go. Agdahl's highest profile relationship before was DiCaprio. She did it for one year before breaking up amicably in 2017. So she's 31. Divided by six, 25. So she knew, oh yeah, 25, that's done. Listen, the celebrities can do whatever the hell they want. Okay, and Logan Paul can get whatever he wants. Why does he want to get married? Because the thing is, even though this is, if this is all like pretty much like, you know, smoke and mirrors, the whole idea is that if he actually goes through with the marriage, you know, he's the one that probably has more more funds than she does. And he's just setting himself up to get married so that he loses half what he gets. Because that's not going to be a long-standing relationship. It's pretty obvious there. But again, it's not like Logan Paul's made a lot of great decisions either. Okay? Let's make it like that too. But I guess for people that feel like, well, look at him. He's got the model girlfriend, this and that. You know, that's the whole idea of trying to put this out there. And then Dan has frequently targeted Nina Agdahl to get in the way to Logan Paul in the build-up to the fight. Quote, I just got another absolute nuke of a pick, uh, a pick of Nina. That well, This one might be worse than one. Other one, while the girl is actually wild. Dylan Danis writes on X. And then he writes again and says, Logan, on a man level, you need to call this marriage off now. And I agree with Dylan Danis. Regardless of how he feels, that's just all of this. Now, Paul is returning the boxing for grudge match against Danis on the undercard of KSI's match with Tommy Fury. And Logan Paul's 28 years old, 23.6 million subscribers on YouTube, has been in other fields. He's done boxing, he's done wrestling. Obviously, if you listen to my Wrestling is Real program, you know we've heard about that. And there have been several women that have leaped to the defense of Lena Agdahl, including OnlyFans star Karina Kopf. Listen, if you're getting the OnlyFans stars, this is also like a very much big influencer of all Karina Kopf. Blasting Dennis's actions in a blistering treat. 
She said, quote, I can't be the only one who thinks Dylan Dan is the corniest fuck for harassing the fuck out of a woman for absolutely no reason. Talk to the person you're fighting, not his fiance. Also, someone tell him to stop sending and unsending messages to me and my friends. You look so desperate, my guy. An adult film star, Lena the Plug, chimed in to offer support to Agdow, replying to, replying to Cop's tweet and condemning the big MMA fighter as a big loser. Big loser energy, they said. So, yeah, there's that part, too. <laughs> Wow, this is crazy. No surprise there either. You know, more bullshit. But it's like people want to have the outrage of it. But at the end of the day, I'm not ending the show yet. I'm just saying this is a couple of great examples of being depraved and debaucherous, which is the focus of this program. I will say it again as I close the show out, but I wanted to say it before because there's two more stories I want to bring up before we wrap up the half hour. Psychology Today asks the question, can we really find compatible partners from online dating? Is it worth it? They talk about a study that talks about whether online daters were more likely to choose dating profiles featuring particular personality traits and whether they chose dating profiles featuring personality descriptions similar to their own. And this is a 2023 study. They looked at openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and emotional stability. The big five personality inventory, they call it. They went and looked at 100 sim- simulated dating profiles to pick the images of faces along with gender-neutral personality descriptions and participants were said to say yes or no. So swipe left or swipe right. The participants preferred profiles that had been prejudged as being agreeable and emotionally stable. And partic- participants tended to prefer profiles that had been judged as being more introverted. However, levels of conscientiousness and openness did not affect the number of choices made by participants. Now, there's more to it, but I'm going to leave that there. I want to make one point. There was an episode, an interview that I did for the program, and I already posted it before this episode. And that was with the folks at DreamGF.ai. Listen, I got the opportunity to talk to the folks that are building, that had this website in play that allows you to go ahead and use AI to build your dream girlfriend. Listen, it's already going to happen. And maybe some of you out there, guys or gals, and you don't want to just go into any relationship with somebody with any real emotional feelings, you let the algorithm, you let the AI generated, computer generated girl or guy be your companion. They get to know you better. They get to understand you better. And then they get to, you know, get close to you in some way, shape or form online. So that's what the whole idea was of this. And I was like, okay. And I talked to them about this. We go through the whole scenario. So if you want to know, understand what, you know, creating a computer generated AI dream girlfriend is, you could check out my interview with George Mark and Jeff Dillon. And that's right here on the channel. So take a look at that. King of podcasts.com. It's one of the last episodes I put up right before this one. If you're listening to it on the download or you're listening, you know, and you subscribe through Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google, or, you know, wherever Amazon. You got it there. One of the story came out was about how to date without an app and that more people are trying to date out of apps. That plenty of people can still be introduced to their communities and social networks that you need to try to start looking for romantic partners nearby. And when they talk about, you know, the dating apps are common, but doesn't mean you can't meet people organically. It's what we used to do. They make the point in the story here that the hardest part can't be knowing where to look. So whether you're done with dating apps or good, or if you just want to give yourself more options, you got to find ways to meet people on the wild. You lean on your friends. That's how it used to be. Look around, join a club. Those are some of the things they recommended in that story with that being said. All right. Well, that's the show for tonight. So where are you on the side of all this? Are you on the side where you want to be, you know, in the area where, you want to be where Betty and Veronica and Archie and Jughead are in? Do you want to be in that part and do what they're doing together? Does that sound like something that you want to be a part of? Do you want it to be where, you know, you want to be like Logan Paul being completely blind to what's going on with his girlfriend who obviously has been around a lot and is so sexually hungry Okay, she's starving for sex. There's no way that Logan Paul has the kind of stamina to keep her satisfied. So 
what is he going to do? Get married and then become an open relationship after that? And then everything goes really totally depraved and debaucherous? <laughs> 